Okay, let's get them open. Let's dial in. Whatever you got to do. It's the only reason why you're going to be on your cell phone is if your Bible's on it. Amen. 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 So I give everybody permission to be that, that, that teacher's aide and look over your neighbor's shoulder every so often. Amen. And make sure if they're on Facebook, they're posting something that they heard. Amen. Y'all with me? So everyone's going to look over and see. So let's hold up our Bibles or our phones so I could just check. Bible check. All right. Okay. All right. Put it down. I'm not even really looking. (laughs) But we're in the book of Acts. This came to me this morning uh, when I was praying and getting ready. How when someone asks us, like, what the history of Higher Hope is, because, you know, we're 22 years old in June. The fact of the matter is, well... Our church is super way older than 22 years old because as you're reading the book of Acts, this is our history. This is our history. It's the history of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And if we are the church of Jesus Christ, this is our history. So everyone just say that with me. This is our history. So, wow. So this is all, this is part of our history. So looking at it, it helps me with my identity. Because when you know where you come from, it gives you an identity. Someone say amen, right? It gives you that assurance, that confidence. It helps you understand. So I love the details. I love the information. Even as, as a son, uh, I, sometimes I wish I knew more about my family's history. A lot of things didn't get passed on. People didn't tell all the stories and we don't know all the details. And when I catch a glimpse of something, I get all excited to hear, okay, and what, what happened with who and, and, and who's the crazy uncle again? Someone say amen, right? And what did they do and what did they own or where did they live? What did, it's just awesome. And this is giving us, thank goodness Luke wrote this book because he's very detail-oriented and under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit, he's telling us those details that get our hearts glad and we're just, all, you'll see more and more as he unfolds how oriented he is to win time, places, people and what was happening. Say amen with me. So we finally made it to chapter 3. Praise God. Since January, let's clap. We made it to chapter 3. Yes. Chapter 3. So we're not, and the whole thing is this is verse by verse by verse. We're letting it just kind of lead us on as we share in the word of God. So let's hear the word of God starting from verse 1 of chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. Where was he laid at? The gate of the temple. Amen. Which is called beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. What did Peter say? Yes. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. And I'm going to read verse 11. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's porch, which is called Solomon's porch. Listen, they were greatly amazed. Amen. Amen. I get double vision. I don't have my glasses on (laughs) my readers. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Oh, I just love this book as we eat the whole book together. And we see what God is doing. We see what Jesus, through the apostles and the early church, what he continues to do. I love the thought to always remember, God is still on the move. Amen? 
So we start off with this real simple, now Peter and John. Everyone say Peter and John. I love it. They were fishing buddies originally. They were partners in the fishing business. They were fishing buddies. I love that. Fishing buddies now here. They were also runners. How many people know they were both on a, um, on a, on a team, a running team? Yep, because they both ran to the tomb together, right? It was Peter and John, right? They're fishing buddies. They, they, they were runners. And how many people know they were also really competing to who was going to be the great, right? How many people know that they had a little competitive spirit about themselves? Who's going to be great? Who's going to sit on your blessed side, you know? And, and so here now we don't see any of that. We see the two of them working together together faithfully committed to serving God together. We don't see the competition anymore. It's not about who's greatest. They are serving God together. May us as believers stop competing with one another and start seeing that we should be on the same mission together as one. Say amen. And I love it. And let that be for us as individuals, but let that be for all the churches in the Susquehanna Valley. We're not here to compete with each other. There's a lost world that we are seeking to reach. And here's what I love, how God uniquely equips each and every church like he equips us to go and reach a unique group of people, perhaps in our community, that would not be reached. Praise God for all the churches. Come on, praise God for his church and for all of our differentness. There we are. That's so beautiful. So Peter and John, partners serving together, going up to the temple to pray. Let's just talk about this. You have to remember from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 2, you will see the divide uh, will begin to happen where it will go from Jewish community, Jewish Christians, to then it will become more of what we would call the church that we see today, right? It will, it will branch away from the Jewish traditions more and more. Right now, they're pretty locked in. They go to the temple to pray, but guess what? They know now who they're praying to. Someone say amen, right? But there was still this this reality. It wasn't until the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70 that it's like done deal. They actually then made this thing where Jesus, none of the people like, look, you could not be in any synagogue if you believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Somebody hear that, right? So we see this togetherness. So they went to the temple as was the tradition. It was time for the evening offering. It was the ninth hour. Everyone say the ninth hour. That's, that's about 3 p.m., they're, they're going there, as, as tradition would have it, to go and confess sins. Prayers would be offered. Sacrifices would be made there. And here they were going up. And the Bible says in that hour as they went, a certain man, lame. Everyone say lame. lame. I told someone today, they said, what is the sermon going to be about today? I said, it's going to be a lame sermon. <laughs> they looked at me strangely. But, of course, here is a lame man. He was lame. His feet. His legs, they didn't work. He was lame. And the Bible gives us this detail because Luke is detail-oriented, a physician. Here's what he says about this. This man was lame since he was in his mother's womb. He was always this way. Couldn't walk, had no use of his legs. This is interesting because this is not the time when there was a lot of, uh, there was very little low value for this. Can you just think about this guy for a second? In these days, there wasn't this, oh no, ADA approved realities or, or any of that kind of stuff existed. Someone hear me, amen? These people were very low value. They were pushed to the side. They were marginalized. And matter of fact, his lameness actually caused him not to be able to enter in and participate in worship because there was no reality for them that was lame or any kind of defect like that to come into a place of worship. Isn't that something? His condition that he was born in kept him outside. He was at the gate, boy, what a, at the door of the temple, but couldn't get inside. This was his condition. This was his plight, you know, growing up. And here, he had no ability to make money. So it only, he not only was poor, but he would have to be one who begged. Everyone say beggar. I was born and raised in New York City. and, And so going to church, we went to church in Harlem. That's in Manhattan. 
we would have to travel and stop at these lights. And all you would see back, especially in the 70s and 80s, you would see there was beggars there that would come to your window and knock on your window and beg for change. And when you walked around the streets there, you would see people sitting on the streets, shaking their can and looking and begging for money. Anybody have that experience? Well, you, especially in the bigger cities, you see that people are begging, begging, begging. And, and you know, so here, this man, he was carried, he was carried because he couldn't make it. So some friends, family members, they would carry him. And the, it's, the, it's the tradition of the Herod's uh, temple that there was great steps. So someone would carry him up and set him at the door of the gate, which was called beautiful. This beggar, his plight, his viewpoint, he was low. He looked up to people. People were looking down towards him all day long. And he was at the mercy of their generosity. Now check this out. This would be interesting. There, The law, especially that the Jewish community would follow, really required that they took care of the poor. So this is interesting. They're going to the temple to uh, confess their sins. And so here, right before they get in the door, there's a beggar who's lame, who has no way, who's begging them for money. So perhaps he got some change because of the wanting to clean the, the, the guilt riddenness off of the people's hearts before they went in the temple. It would be like kind of like that self-righteous act perhaps and so he saw it all and they saw him and he was there forever and ever always at the gate to the fact that they he was a staple there they knew that that was where bob was going to be when they got in the door he don't have a name but i just call him bob amen he was there he wasn't a beggar because of a bad choice he made he was a beggar because that was the condition he was born in. I want you all to think about that, saved people. So he was carried. And they laid him daily. The Bible says daily, every day. Every day. Every day. Oh, listen to this. He's sitting there with his legs not working, watching people walk by him all day with their legs. Just think about his perspective for a second. Seeing them pass by. See, at the level that he could see the legs that they had and acknowledging that his don't work. Every day, one by one by one, clockwork, they would carry him, sit him, he would watch people all day, walk to and fro. And I know this, that when I'm in the city and, and even in other countries where there's beggars, I have this rule, like you just don't make eye contact with them. And y'all know from New York and Philly and that you just don't look at them. You don't look at them. Because you know if you lock eyes, then you're going to, you, they, because they're saying, help me, help me, give me some change, sir. Once you lock eyes, you got a whole nother scenario to go with, right? Because now you're going to have to be rude. Someone say amen. Or scared, or some of you guys. We took a bus trip to New York with some of y'all. Y'all gave out so much money. <laughs> Half the people y'all gave money to is not homeless at all. They got nicer cars than y'all. <laughs> Pastor Mark, but no, trust me. I lived here. You don't make eye contact. Because that changes everything. People just keep on looking straight. Look straight. Don't worry about it. Don't look over. But the Bible says, and I love this thought, the Bible says that here, the, Peter, he did the opposite. He fixed his eyes on him. Peter and John, they looked him in the eye. I'm going to tell you this. So this just made this man, he was like, I'm going to get something today. Because they're looking at me. They're looking at me. And so the Bible even says that the, he had this, he was expecting to receive the eye contact, cause his heart probably, I mean, thinking and saying, yep, here goes another piece of change. These people are going to bless me with something. They, he was expecting to receive. And what was he expecting to receive? Money. He had no clue what he was going to get. He was getting ready to get hit by a train in a second. Someone say amen. amen. A blessing train. Amen. Okay. Something great was going to happen and he had no clue. He was just going about his normal daily life. No clue. And here, as you know, he, here, here these disciples come and I love it. This is so good for the prosperity gospel because this, listen to this. It says, when the man reached out and asked for it, you know, asking for money, 
He says this. Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. What? These are real Christians, right? But he's saying, Peter and John say, we're earthly broke. We're earthly broke. We don't got no money. Imagine this. No money. But he says, but we're heavenly rich. We, we are heavenly rich. He says, look, what I do have, I'm going to give to you right now. And he says this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He evoked the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it wasn't, you say, well, what, what is in a name? It represented all who Jesus was, his incomplete character, his complete authority. And think about the shock of this man and the people perhaps that walk by to hear them evoke a name of a tried and convicted criminal who was executed. Imagine this. You're sitting there at the gate, and these guys, you say, give me some money. And they say, no, we got something better, silver and gold we don't have. But in the name of Jesus Christ, wow, pick up your bed and walk. The convicted, crucified criminal, his name, there, what a shocking reality. Because in that moment, this one who sat at the gate that they called beautiful, History says about 75 feet tall, over 60 feet wide, and made of bronze and, and, and detailed with gold. Check the contrast. A poor man next to a symbol of wealth that he cannot benefit from. Sitting there, hearing these ones that looked at him, saying, pick up your bed and walk. That is, that's just incredible. Look, look, no, the man, no faith, no waiting, no physical therapy. Where's Chris at? No music, no tent service, no workshop on healing, no oil. I'm not setting people. I'm just telling you how it is. I, I'm just reading the facts. I, I'm not saying it didn't work for you. If it worked, praise God. But I'm just telling you what our church history says. There was no altar call. The man didn't even, he didn't even know it was coming. He was expecting cash. You can't say he was waiting, expecting for his healing. No, he accepted his plight. I'm going to be a beggar for all my life. I'm going to sit here every day, day after day. His, probably his biggest worry was who's going to carry me there. No expectation. And you know what? I find Jesus to be very similar in our lives because we were definitely born in sin and shaped in iniquity and having that hopelessness, not able to stand in Jesus' name. And yet we find that mercy and grace finds us unexpected. We just going about our lives. Oh, somebody invited me to church. I'm going to go to church. All of a sudden, you get something you didn't think you would ever ever, ever imagine to have. Come on, church, we ought to praise God right now. We ought to praise him. We ought to praise him. That, that's, that, is, that is the blessing that came, this lame, poor, poor, outside, not even worthy to be inside, outside the temple. Grace found him. And, you know, for us, remember, this is a, the, the, the book of Acts. It opens up in that Jewish reality. And we remember, what were the people thinking and seeing? This guy, he got up and he had a meeting. It was no gradual. It wasn't, no, 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 a few steps first. The Bible says he instantly got up as he was reached out a hand. And the Bible says this man received ankle bone strength. Someone say amen. And his feet started working. This is a supernatural miracle. Amen. This is like it shouldn't have worked, but now it worked instantly. Amen. This is saying this is what God has done. And this is my this is my issue with some of us when we're when we're looking at these signs and wonders that people claim often to be. We look. I want to see the supernatural evidence, amen. not what Tylenol can do. Come on, say Amen. And not what the doctor can do. I want to see what God can do. And then tell me. Come on, say it. Say that. 
say that. So he, he's showing us. But even more than that, here's the depth of it. Isaiah, just turn there really quick. Isaiah chapter 35. Because what were they seeing? What were they hearing? Isaiah 35. I'm going to read from verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind. This is, this is about the future glory of Israel. This is about what's to come. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open. Oh, Jesus did that. Okay. And the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Verse 6. Then the lame shall leap like a deer. Did you guys hear that? And the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Did you hear that? That the lame shall leap like a deer. Okay, now turn back to Acts with me because I, I'm seeing this right here. And so he, in verse 8, he leaping up, right, stood up, walked, entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Amen. Like a deer, he is leaping. That is incredible. This man never walked before. He never ran before. Come on, y'all been to physical therapy. You see how people have to learn how to walk again? This man never ran ever a day in his life. He never knew what it was like to play basketball. Or, come on, you'll hear me? None of it. He didn't skip ever a day in his life. The only place he ever did that was probably in his imagination. This is supernatural. This is amazing, but yet it was no surprise to us that believe the word of God, because even in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, just, just write that down to the side, because this is the work of the apostle. Here's what I'm going to tell you this. This miracle is very intentional and is strategic. Please, how many people believe that God has a divine and sovereign will? Raise your hand. This is not just per chance that some dude was sitting at the gate of the temple. And that all of this transpired. This is God doing something very, very important. And here's one of the things. First of all, how do I know that the apostles and all that they're going to say and reveal is of God? But I need the signs and the miracles to prove who they say they are. They are doing what Jesus also has done. They are showing themselves to be true apostles by demonstrating. And this is why, check this. Every time before they get ready to preach, you'll see this. There'll always be a prelude to the sermon. A demonstration of saying, hey, this is what I'm saying. The healing wasn't the key important reality. It was the message that would come after the healing. The demonstration, it wasn't just for the sympathy or the compassion of the lame man. It was for the demonstration of God's power and his message to come forward. There will always, we will see it over and over again. The message will always come after the demonstration. This is, this is why, look, this is important. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 says, like these signs are one of these are apostolic evidences here's what we, we we stop doing when we start letting people have revelations outside of the revelation that the apostles gave us we have all of these false religions that have risen up because people heard something from god that's not confirmed in here you want to look at a couple of them trust me they'll organize as cults and, and yet people will give their lives for it, and yet it will be what they heard from God. What, what, you, you realize that that's what the enemy does? So then now he's like, oh, I get a revelation. People come, oh, God told me. If God tells you something that's outside of what God said in here, I'm good. I'm good. The apostles demonstrated there was always... Look, this is why I got to stick to this word. I can't give you some, oh, this is what Mark said. No, no, I always got to, we got to preach the doctrine Amen. of the word of God. Amen? Amen? Following in this, this is so important. So there, there was that demonstration, and I love it. It was very specific. People saw this man walking. This wasn't isolated. This wasn't in a church service. This wasn't after my favorite worship song. 
This was in public where people, the Jewish community, was going in. They saw this man and he was not unknown to them. This is important. If you pull this story out of context, you can make it mean anything you want. You can sell it whatever snake oil you want to. But when you put it back in there and say, where were they? Who was there? What was going on? It changes all of it and puts it in its proper content. So they saw him, the Bible said, and they knew him. So dude was known. Amen. They knew he was. Why was this important? Because here the sermon's going to soon come to them. The demonstration has happened. They have to listen. This is what happened in John chapter 3. Remember Nicodemus comes and says, look, Jesus, I know you're the one because look at the signs and wonders that you do. I know you're the man. They're going to listen to this sermon coming forth. And here's what's great, that sometimes when Peter preaches, it's, uh, it seems like the blessings flow, and other times the persecution flows. But either way, the word was going to come forth. Y'all with me? This was a demonstration. And I love it all throughout chapter 3. It points us to who he's talking to because he even says, look, in, in verse 13, just real quick, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, our fathers. You heard that? In verse 25, he says, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. So he's talking to them. When he gets into that sermon, getting ready to preach, we'll talk about it next week. He's talking really right to this Jewish community. Very important. So the, the young man becomes the demonstration of the power of God. He's leaping just as the Old Testament said would occur when that restoration, when that kingdom was coming in. There's the leaping like a deer. There's this walking and this praising of God. There's this supernatural event right in the face of the people who the message will soon go forth. Are y'all still with me? The people saw him and they knew who he was. He's the one who sat begging. The one who sat in contrast to the wealth of the the door to the temple, religion. The one who couldn't come in. But now the one who is leaping all over that place. I sometimes I see this in those that have come to Christ. They come in here. They're so full of joy. It makes religious people mad. You want to disturb the status quo, have someone grace fall upon them and they come to Jesus and try to put them in your little corny Bible study and see what happens. They will mess that Bible study up because they leap, leap, leap. They're all, they're excited. And can you blame them? Come on, church. Can you blame them? Come on. They want to tell people we would, I was just hoping to feel a little better. But instead, I got blessed. I got saved. I got forgiveness. I got new life. My legs work. I'm walking. Come on, church. I started walking. I can walk now. That's what it feels like being saved, man. Like, wow, I can walk. These didn't work before, but now they work. That is a supernatural work of God's grace. That is the gospel message. And when it comes to that one and their heart, man, it comes to Jesus and they confess and they repent. Oh, the joy. I want you to see that they wanted this. This is so important. The people could witness the change because of the filling of joy of this man. He couldn't help but praise and they couldn't help but be a witness to his praise. This is, this is the book of Acts on fire. And guess what? All of this, so that God could give this great illustration to be the prelude before the sermon. You know, I, I was thinking, I said, it would be so nice is if the church would be the church and we'd be out there with the gospel message and people come to Christ. And instead of, you know, before the sermon, instead of all the songs, Maybe a testimony as a prelude of the demonstration of what God's power can do. A testimony that, hey, I once was lost, but now I'm found. 
a testimony where we see those in our community. We say, there ain't no hope for them, but they come and stand before us. There are some people in this congregation today that I am saying, but by the grace of God, I am so glad that you have come to Christ. And I am saying, thank you, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It is awesome. And it was immediate. And it was the power of God. And there was no question that this had to be a work of God. Think about the change and the transformation. The Bible says that the people were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And I want to show you this last verse in verse 11, and I'll close. It says this, Now as the lame man who was held, healed, held on to Peter and John. What did he do? He held on. I want you to see this. This is important. He identified himself with the apostles. He held on to them. Boy, everybody there running together seeing this. And and, and history tells us that this place was probably full of people that were sick, people that were crippled. But yet this one, grace found him. And God's getting ready to rock out another spirit-filled sermon. You know, I was thinking to myself, I said, has my life and my testimony of God's grace, has it been a, a people looking in amazement at what God is doing and what he's done and what he's doing and what he will do in my life? How about your life? Are you so full of praise because of what God has done in your life that you cause people to notice the change? And then if they do, now remember, the apostles were the only, that, that was the only one that he could grab a hold of. This is, this is the one who brought him this hope in the name of Jesus, right? He held on to it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Are we clinging to the one who has forever changed us? I just would like to believe that we wouldn't just leap and leave. But we would leap and hold on to. Isn't it strange that those guys wrote this up here, Peter and John, and and we could cling to them in ways and by clinging to the word of God and opening it up and saying, "What, what did they say for us? What do we learn from them? Is it important? Yes, it's God's word. Let us also hold on to all of the apostles' doctrines, the word of God, with all our strength and all of our hope and all our might. Because each and every one of us was laying at a gate called beautiful. Broke. Hurt. Looked down on. Feeling valueless. And then one day, someone locked eyes intentionally on us. What we thought we needed wasn't our need at all. But we were just too broken to see what our real need was. And when we least expected, we heard the words that changed our life because of the name that's above every name the name of Jesus the only name by which we must be saved listen (laughs) what a day after all those years some of you even in this room that you would walk in newness of life That the mercy and the grace of God would reach forth a hand towards you and lift you to your feet. And you can go from beggar to the dance team. And mess the whole religious system up. Hmm. Praising God. I'm thankful that I'm walking and I'm leaping. And I'm praising God today. Come on, y'all. Let's give God some praise. Thank you, Jesus.